Before fingerprint from a crime scene can be identified, we need to be able to compare those prints to suspects. The FBI's APHIS, or Automated Fingerprint Database, has over 50 million fingerprints stored. These prints are from individuals who have been previously fingerprinted. In order to fingerprint an individual, you'll need what is called a 10 card and fingerprint ink. We describe this process as rolling prints because the process to obtain the prints involves rolling the finger across the 10 card. This results in a square-shaped fingerprint rather than an oval finger fingerprint. The square-shaped fingerprint is better because it captures fingerprint ridges that may be on the sides of the finger. This process can also be done electronically. When prints are taken electronically, the in individual's fingers are rolled across a scanner. Ink is not needed when the prints are taken electronically. When searching for fingerprints at a crime scene, investigators will often use fingerprint powder to help them find the invisible latent fingerprints. The dust is attracted to the oils and fingerprints. Dusting for fingerprints can be done on many kinds of hard, non-absorbent surfaces like tile, mirror, or, in this case, glass. The powders come in many different colors. A couple of colors that you see here are red, green, silver, black, or white. The investigator will typically select a powder in a color that has high contrast with the surface that is being dusted. For example, if we were fingerprinting a black countertop, the investigator would probably prefer to use white fingerprint powder rather than black powder. There are two types of fingerprint powder, charcoal powder and magnetic powder. With charcoal powder, investigators typically use a brush. The brushes are often made of either camel hair or fiberglass. A small amount of powder is placed on the brush, then the brush is lightly twisted above the surface uh, that investigators are hoping to obtain fingerprints from. This is done with a very light touch. The brush sometimes doesn't even touch the surface, so as not to smudge the prints that are discovered. After the powder is applied, the prints are lifted by placing a piece of clear plastic tape over the newly discovered prints. The fingerprint powder is then more attracted to the tape than the oils on the print and sticks to the tape. Charcoal powder is most commonly used by investigators more so than magnetic powder. However, one very strong advantage of, the, of uh, magnetic powder is that it is very easy to clean up. The powder itself is magnetic, and instead of using a brush, investigators use a wand. The wand has a plunger on one end that, when pulled, moves a magnet on the other end of the wand. The magnetic powder is attracted to the wand when the plunger is down, and then is released from the wand when the plunger is lifted. The process of dusting with magnetic powder is essentially the same as with charcoal powder. The powder is lightly applied to the surface, then tape is used to lift the print. Dusting for prints is very safe, inexpensive, and easy to use. There are very minimal safety concerns with either magnetic or charcoal fingerprint powder when correctly used. Not every surface can be easily dusted for fingerprints. In the case of plastics, metals, glass, and cadaver skin, it may be more convenient to use cyanoacrylate vapor, also known as superglue fuming. This process heats up superglue and vaporizes the superglue. The superglue fumes are attracted to the amino acids and the oils of the fingerprints and will bind to them, leaving behind a visible white print. This process has some serious safety concerns though. Superglue vapors are not healthy to breathe, so this process must be done in a fume hood. There are portable fume hoods that can be used at the crime scene safely. This method is useful when trying to search for prints in a large area. Investigators may use this method if they are trying to find fingerprints in the entire interior of a car, for example. The last method of obtaining latent prints that we'll talk about is iodine fuming. In iodine fuming, solid iodine crystals are heated and through sublimation turn from solid state to a gaseous state. The iodine gas binds to the carbohydrates in the fingerprint. The amount of heating needed in this process is fairly minimal. In fact, in the past, investigators used to use the warmth of their hand to heat the iodine crystals and their breath to disperse the vapor over the surface they were hoping to find prints. We now know that's an extremely bad idea because there are a lot of safety concerns with using iodine crystals. Iodine can be toxic and the vapors can be especially toxic to breathe, so this also must take place in a fume hood using only a very small amount of iodine. This method works very well with unpainted surfaces, cardboard, or paper, as you're seeing here.
The print turns a deep yellow or brown and should be photographed immediately. The other advantage to this method is that it is temporary, unlike some of the other methods. It does not permanently alter the, eth the evidence being tested. The iodine will eventually, eventually sublimate from the print, returning the evidence to the way it looked before iodine fuming. If the investigator does not want the iodine fume print to fade, they can fix the print permanently by applying a starch solution to the print. This turns the print a deep purple or black color. Thank you.